Preparing for Pentecost. Preparing for Pentecost. Now, we call it Pentecost, and we know that it's coming because we're looking with hindsight, 2020 vision, and we know that the disciples aren't going to have to wait a long time after Jesus promises very soon the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. Uh, very soon you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. It's going to be very soon. But the disciples didn't know how soon that was. They didn't know, they, they were, there was a lot that they didn't know, as we'll see this morning, but there were some things they knew. They had, the, they had the command of Jesus, go into the world, and they had the promise of Jesus. But don't go until you receive the gift of the Father. I've told you about him before, and the gift of the Father, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, is going to equip you, empower you, and give you what you need to do what I've asked you to do. Brothers and sisters, it has not changed 2,000 years later for you and me. There are things that God calls us to do. It's in our hearts. We know that God has said, do this, speak this, go here. And sometimes it may be as strong as a missionary call, as we have seen with our missionaries in the Philippines. At other times, it may be, it may be something not as big as that, nevertheless, brothers and sisters, whatever God calls you to do, He never, never, never intends for you and for me to do it in our own strength, in our own way, in our, in our own energy, and in our own power. God has, God has never intended us never intended for us to do his work and his calling and his ministry in that way. If God puts something into your heart to do, he, if you will wait on him and receive from him, he will give you what you need to do what he's called you to do. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Brothers and sisters, it may be something as simple as God, the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and says to you, forgive that person. And you don't want to. It's hard, right? The person hasn't yet said, I'm sorry, and they're not sorry. And yet God has said to you, forgive. How are you going to do that? You can't do it in your own strength or power. That's not humanly possible. The Holy Spirit is going to have to help you do that. But here's our encouragement, and here's our promise. Now, Acts chapter 1 talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit, of power to answer the call of God, as we're going to see, as we see in verses 4 through 5. But brothers and sisters, this principle is true in every area of your life. Whatever God puts in your heart, whatever God calls you and leads you to do, if you will wait on Him and receive His equipping, He will equip you and empower you to do what He's put in your heart. He will give you the grace you need. He will give you the provision you need. He will give you the patience you need. Do you sometimes, when you're around people, you just think, they're driving me crazy. Have you ever thought that before? They're driving me crazy. I, can't, I just can't stand it. I just can't stand it. How are you going to show patience and grace and love to that person? Holy Spirit's going to have to help you. God calls you to do it. So if God calls you to do it, He will give you what you need to do what he's called you to do. That's the promise of God, and we see it so clearly in this first chapter. Amen? Amen. And so, he's with them, he's eating with them, and as I told you last week, uh, so the Jews believed, I want, I want to make clear, because there were several questions last week. So, so, Pastor Jennifer, you are saying that ghosts don't eat? I am not saying that ghosts don't eat. I am saying the Jews believed ghosts don't eat. And so Jesus spoke to them. Jesus reached them at their level of understanding. Does that make sense? Jesus always comes to us at the level where we are um, to help us understand his ways and his works. And so he was eating with them. He was fellowshipping with them. What does he tell them? Don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the gift 
that the Father has promised, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he wanted them to know that. They've been trained by Jesus. They have walked with him for three years. They have seen Jesus walk on water. They have seen Jesus raise the dead. They have, they have seen Jesus himself crucified and risen from the dead in the power of the Spirit. They have received his teaching for three years. They've had OJT for all of this time. Remember the OJT when Jesus sent them out and he says, I give you authority, now go do this. They come back rejoicing. Oh, all of these things have happened. Brothers and sisters, all of that has been true of their lives. And yet Jesus says to them, Wait in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Father. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. And if they need that, you and I need that as well. We cannot do God's work, God's way, without God's power. Let me say it again. We cannot do God's work in God's way without God's power. We've got to have it. We've got to have the provision and the gift that God gives us. I want to say one other thing as we look at this. The gift that he promised, he baptized with water, but just in a few days, in just a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want you to see that he, Jesus does not say, although I know this is sometimes an expression, Jesus does not say, I will give you a prayer language. Jesus does not say, I will give you the gift of tongues. Never, ever, ever reduce God, the Holy Spirit, to a prayer language, to some tongues. He is God. He's God as much as Jesus is God. He's God as much as God the Father is God. He's God in our lives. And the promise of Jesus is he's going to be given as a gift to you in just a few days. Jesus had come to the end of his earthly bodily ministry. He had been born. He'd come as a man. He had lived in the flesh and for three and a half years, roughly, he had ministered. And he came to the end of that time and Jesus finished his work. He finished his work. He did what God called him to do. You know what, brothers and sisters? Jesus is a pattern for us as well. God has things for you to do. He has things for me to do. And if he has things for us to do, it's for us to do. It's not for someone else to do. He has people we want, that he wants us to speak to, not the pastor, not whatever. You, you. God has something for you to do. And he gives us the Holy Spirit that we might do the work that he's called us to do. So Jesus has come to the end of his ministry at this point. Remember on the cross what he said right at the end? What did he say? It is finished. It is finished. And that means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is God Father, I have done what I was sent to do. I fully completed it. I've done it. It's finished. It's finished. And he came what he, he came and finished what he was going to do, and now he's getting ready to go back to heaven. But there's still work to do. And so Jesus is going to go back to heaven, and he's going to ask the Father. Uh, this is put in terms so that we can understand. Of course, the Father knows this already. But the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus has finished his work, and now the work that is still left to do is put in the hands of the Holy Spirit, who is going to come and indwell believers, you and me, and listen carefully, the Holy Spirit living in you and me, the Holy Spirit living in your body, the Holy Spirit living in your flesh. He is going to carry out the works of the Father and the works of Jesus in this time that we have. There is no other way God is going to get his work done on earth. Did you know that? He's not going to send angels to do it. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Bible is very clear. God does not have another plan B in his back pocket if this plan fails. Understand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be disrespectful of God. But you and I, equipped and infilled and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we are essential to God's plan in this earth, 
in these days and in these last days. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and empowering us and equipping us, we can't do what God has called us to do. And God's work will not be carried out and fulfilled in this time that we have. Jesus came, did his work in the body, went back to heaven. Who is now the body of Jesus on the earth? The New Testament says this very clearly. You and I are the body of Christ in the earth with the infilling, emp empowering, and indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so, Jesus tells them the Holy Spirit's coming. Not, he's going to give you the gift of tongues, although there will be tongues. It's not, he's going to give you a prayer language, although tongues is one of the languages of prayer. It's one of the languages of prayer. Are there other languages of prayer? Sure there are. Tears are languages of prayer at times. Crying out to God, it's a language of prayer. The mother tongue that you speak, it's a language of prayer. But tongues is one of the languages of prayer, excuse me, as well. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit is coming. And so they get excited about this, don't they? Wow, the Holy Spirit's going to be given and there's going to be power. They're really excited about this. How many of you would be excited if you were one of the disciples? I mean, they're really excited. But do you know why they're so excited? They're not excited because... Um, the Holy Spirit is coming and we're going to receive the gift that Jesus has promised and then we're going to be his witnesses in the world. That's not why they're excited. Do you know why they're excited? Mm. Look at verse 6. What do they say? So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Oh my goodness, brothers and sisters, take a look at this and let it be a lesson to us this morning because we are just like the disciples, aren't we? We really are. They're so excited. The Holy Spirit's coming and we're going to have power. And they're not interested in all the things that Jesus is interested in. Do you know what they're interested in? They're interested in me, 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 me. That's what they're interested in. They say, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel, restore our kingdom? think with me, and this is on your notes. Jesus, if you look at verse 3, if you look at verse 3, if you've got your Bibles, it says that Jesus gave them many convincing proofs and he talked to them about what? The kingdom of God. What Jesus is talking about is the kingdom of God. What are the disciples interested in? Kingdom of Israel. That's not what Jesus is focused on. Jesus is not talking about one kingdom. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And they're looking at something that just has to do with themselves. What else is Jesus talking about? Jesus is telling them, and you will go to the ends of the earth. The very ends of the earth. Places they had never been. That they had never thought about. What are they interested in? They're not interested in, in the ends of the earth. They're interested in... Their Jewish nation. That's the only thing they cared about. That's all they cared about. Jesus is talking to them about a power that will be what? It will be power to be witnesses. It will be power that transform their lives. They're not interested in that type of power. Do you know what they're thinking about? We're going to have power and we're going to have power to be rulers. We're going to have political power. We're going to have authority. I'll bet Peter was thinking, mm, if Jesus is going to be king, I'm going to be, I'm going to be prime minister <laughs> or chief executive or something like that. And probably one of the others was thinking, I'm going to be in charge of inland revenue. And, and, and another one was thinking, and I'm going to be the uh, interior minister or the secretary of state or some, something like that. I'll bet you they had it all figured out. I'm going to be this, this, and this. Do you know why we know that's what they were thinking? Because the Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us so. They were arguing all the time. I'm greater. No, I'm greater. I'm gr no, I'm greater. No, Jesus likes me better. Parents, how many times have your kids, if you have more than one kid, do you know that argument that sometimes happens with kids? Mommy loves me best. <laughs> That, that happens all the time. It's human nature. It's human nature. That's how it is. I'm the preferred one. And that's what they were arguing about. And Jesus is trying, Jesus is trying to get them changed and to look at it differently. But guess what, brothers and sisters? That's not going to happen until 
what? Until the Holy Spirit comes. Until the Holy Spirit comes. So they ask for this, and the Lord immediately, what does he do? Look at verse 7. He redirects them. He redirects them, and he says, the Father is in charge of this timing, but this, these other things will happen to you. And when the Holy Spirit comes, brothers and sisters, this is what he does in the disciples at that time, and this is what he does in your life and in my life. The Holy Spirit comes in, he takes control, he becomes boss, and the things that you wanted before that were for you, that pleased you, it seemed like a good thing, it seems like a good thing, but it's about you, and it's about your desires. The Holy Spirit comes in, and He takes charge, and He changes your priorities. He changes my priorities. He changes my way of thinking. He changes my outlook. He refines me. He redirects me into his purposes and not mine, and he has to do that. That is one of the reasons Jesus tells the, the disciples. He knows what's in their hearts. He sees it. And they have proven it by saying, Is, has the time come? We get to be boss now? Really, that's what they're saying. That's, that's what they're, we get to be boss now, right? We're going to throw off Rome, these Roman soldiers, these Roman laws, these Roman taxes that we've, had, we've been crippled under. Guess what? We're boss now. That's what they're interested in. And Jesus knows they have to have the Holy Spirit to change that way of thinking, to change that outlook. And brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit has to do that in your life and in my life as well. Why, why is the gift of the Holy Spirit called the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why? Because this is, this is what God this is what God inspired it to be called. This was not man's idea. Why is it called the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you a question. That's right. Well, first of all, what is baptism? Remember when you were water baptized? Okay. There you went out into the water at Gold Coast or Stanley or whatever. That's right. It meant death, right? All your sins, your old life. You walked out into the water. And that old life, as you went under the water, it was a symbol. Did it literally wash sins away? No, didn't literally. But it was a symbol of what had happened on the inside. And it was death and that old way of life. You went under the water, and when you came up, there was new life. What was the new life? Life eternal. Life from Jesus in your, in your life. And so there's death, and then there's new life, and it's different life from the life that died and was buried. That's water baptism. Why is baptism, why is Holy Spirit filling called baptism? Why is it baptism? Then there's another baptism. There's something, there's another death then, isn't there? What does it mean when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit? Death, death to self. Death to, well, what's wrong with self? Nothing except self wants to be boss. Does it not? Self wants to be in control. Me, I want to be in charge, what I do. That's why, that's one of the reasons fasting is part of the Christian life. It should be, because <laughs> fasting helps to weaken self, doesn't it? It says, self, you're not going to be boss. My stomach, you're not going to say, you must eat and you must eat now. That's part of the physical part. But when there's Holy Spirit baptism, self, self is put to death. And it's a progressive work. It's a progressive work. And so Jesus says to them, verse 8, but you will receive power. So they're going to have to die to self. There's going to be new life, but it's going to be Holy Spirit life and Holy Spirit controlled life. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Brothers and sisters, the disciples, if they had gone out at that moment proclaiming the news of Jesus, it would have been a mixed message. It would have been the kingdom of Israel. Now we're going to be boss. Jesus is in control and Jesus in charge now. That message has no power to change anybody's life, to transform anybody's life. 
brothers and sisters, if people around us are going to see and receive the hope of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the life of Jesus, it cannot be our message. It cannot come from us. It must be the message that comes, that is born out of the lordship and the rulership and the leading and the guiding and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our lives. That's why, that's why. I never even say, it's a prayer language, it's a tongue, it's this, it's that. There are manifestations of the filling of the Holy Spirit, but He's God and He has come to take control. Amen? He's come to take charge. And when He does, oh, oh, when He does, Christian life is so much easier. It really is, brothers and sisters. It's so much easier. Rather than thinking, Whoa, how can I do what God has called me to do? The Holy Spirit, the gift of God, God himself comes to enable you to do what God has called you to do, to live as God has called you to live, to speak as he has called you to speak, to love, to forgive, to do all of these things. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, when he comes, when he baptizes them, he will redirect them to God's mission and timing. And the Holy Spirit's power, and it's in your notes, he will enable them and us, he will enable Christians to be effective witnesses. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. When Jesus says this, what does he say after that? What does he say next? He has said, and you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. And then what's the next thing that Jesus says? While you think about it, and tell me what he says next. Let me drink some water. What does he say next? He says nothing. Ah, she was in the first service, but that's okay. She knew that. He says nothing. It's the last thing he says. It's the most important thing he wants to leave them with. And with that, the Bible tells us, let's look at verses 9 and following. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. One of the translations says, he was taken up into a cloud before their eyes. That's another translation. And that's another reminder. It is an objective thing. It's not just a feeling. They see him. They see him rise up. Now, take a look at this just a minute. It's the last thing he says. He's talking with them about the Holy Spirit. And then, what happens what happens as he goes up? He rises up in a cloud and they gradually lose sight of him. He does not go poof and disappear, right? I'm not being disrespectful, but he doesn't do that. Has he done that at other times? Has Jesus appeared and disappeared suddenly? Yes, he has. Why doesn't Jesus do that this time? Because this time he's gone for good until 2,000 plus years. This time, he wants them to know, I'm not going to reappear tonight or a few days from now when you're eating again and I'll join you at a meal. Jesus wants them to know, I'm going. And this is it. This is it. He's taken up into a cloud and then they could no longer see him. Can you imagine how they wanted to see him? Wouldn't you do the same thing if you were with Jesus and then he starts to rise and he's disappearing and everybody, they're all trying to see as, the, as he go, as he disappears and as the cloud, and as the cloud rises and as he's hidden from their sight, they're trying to, they're trying to see, where is he going? I, I can still see him just a little bit and then he's gone. He's gone and he's not coming back that they know of. And to reinforce that fact, what happens? As they strained, that gives us an idea of, of how intense they were looking to see Jesus. What does, he, what does it say? It says, two men in robes, in, two white-robed men suddenly appeared, uh, stood among them, and what do they say? Why are you standing here staring into heaven? In other words, he's gone, get on with it. Really, that's what it means. He's gone, get on with what he's told you to do. Um, and it's a confirmation he's not coming back right now. You're not going to see him again in a few days. And they say, Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Now, for those of you that are interested in and study the end times, when the angels say this, they're not talking about the rapture 
of the church that we talk about. The, the taking away of Christians from the earth at some point, I believe in the near future, when it will be, we're gone. We're here one minute and we're gone the next and we'll be with the Lord in, together forever. It's not, this is not what it's talking about. This is talking about what? Is Jesus going to return to earth again someday? Yes or no? Yes, yes he is. When is Jesus coming back someday in the same way as this, as he left? When is he coming back? The, that's after, after the rapture, at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, when the nations of the world and the armies of the world rise up against God, the Bible says Jesus is going to return again. And at that time, everybody will see him. Everybody will see him. He will come in the clouds of the air. That's what it says here. He's going to come back in the same way they saw him go. That means he's going to come in the flesh and he will be seen. Where are they as they are standing there? They're on the Mount of Olives. Do you know what it says all the way back in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah? You can go back and check your notes. You can check your first notes. You can check the Bible later. But if you'll look, at that first handout, you'll see we talk about it there in the first handout, the earlier handout. This was, the, this was not today's handout, but a few weeks ago. In Zechariah 14.4, it talks about the return of Jesus. Jesus is going to come back one day, and do you know where his feet are going to land? You mean the feet of Jesus are going to touch the earth? He's not going to float? Nope, he's not going to float. His feet are going to touch the earth. Where? Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. And you say, well, what is that? I don't know about that. I haven't. You go back and read Zechariah 14.4 at another time and read other things. Jesus will come as he is gone. But the main point for the disciples at this point is, basically, he's gone, boys. He's not coming back. Go on and do what Jesus has said to do. So, what do the disciples do next? What do they do next? Let's look at the next slide. What are they going to do? Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Do you notice? Look, are they called disciples or apostles now? They're called apostles. Why are they called? Why does Luke call them apostles now instead of disciples? Because there's the transition from the disciples, those who followed Jesus, to becoming those who will give witness of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So they have now become, they are becoming those who will be the ones who, give, who are the witnesses of Jesus. So they're now apostles, okay? An apostle also means one who is sent. One who is sent. And they have been sent. They're not quite ready to go yet, but they have been sent. And so they're called apostles. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. They, when they arrived, they went to an upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Where is this upstairs room? Do we know where it is today? Nope. We don't know where it is today. Do we know where it was then? Not really, but we have some ideas. Maybe it was where they had the Last Supper. Maybe it is the house of Mary the mother of John Mark. Do you remember Mary, the mother of John Mark? Peter was in prison. They were going to off his head the next day. They're having a prayer meeting for Peter's deliverance. An angel sets Peter free from prison. He goes to the house, so he knew that was the meeting place, right? They didn't have telephones. They didn't have what's up. Hey, we're having a prayer meeting at, 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 at Mary's house. No what's up. It was clearly a place where they gathered. And Peter goes to the door, knocks on the door. Rhoda the servant girl, remember? She goes to the door, ah! And she's so excited, she doesn't even open the door. She goes back. And she tells them, she tells them, Peter is here. And they don't believe her and they say, it's his angel or his ghost as some, tra they had problems with that, didn't they? All sorts of problems with that. That was the house. It was in Jerusalem and probably it was a large house because Mary had, a, had servants at least and John Mark grew up there. And so it may have been the house of Mary, a home where they met. But you'll see, as you look at this, that they met together frequently, and, and so they go back. We don't know exactly, but maybe that's where it is. And so 
they returned to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Now, I want to ask you something. Jesus has promised them, we're coming to a close this morning in the few minutes that we have left. Jesus has promised them the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do they know? There will be power. Do they know how it will happen? Yes or no? They don't know. Do they know where it will happen? They don't know that. Do they know what will happen to them when they are baptized with the Holy Spirit? The only thing they know is we will receive power as we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Do they know when it will be? No. They don't know that either. How are they going to prepare for the gift of the Holy Spirit? This tells us in verse 14. And there's the key verse. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. Who is there? If you read the other verses, the 11 apostles are there. Mary, the mother of Jesus. By the way, this verse, Acts 1.14, is the last time that Mary is mentioned in the Bible. She, we don't hear of her again, but she was part of it. And then the brothers of Jesus. By this time, they believe that Jesus is who he says he is, so they're part of it as well. Some of the other women, and they're gathered there. What do they do? As we come to a close this morning, and here is a guideline for us as well. When God has spoken to your heart, when God has promised you, when you have come to his word and scripture has come alive in your heart, or there's a hope or a prayer or an expectation of your heart, God, this is, this is the rima of God, the, the, the word of God that he makes alive to you. Parents, some of you, let, may I give it just a specific example? Some of you are praying for children that are far from God, and you have the word of God to your heart, the promise of God to your heart, they will come to me. They will be saved. These disciples have the promise of, the, of Jesus. The Father's going to send the Spirit. Do they just sit back and say, okay, the Spirit's going to be given. He has said so, so I know it's going to be. That's not what they do. They don't get complacent. They don't get careless. They don't say, well, he said it, so it's going to be. I'm just going to do my thing. The Bible tells us very clearly. They met together. They all met together. And this word together doesn't just mean, hey, we're all together here Sunday morning here on Lighthouse on the second floor. Do you know what that word together means? That word together means with one heart, one mind, and one passion. That's what it means. So there was a togetherness, a unity of prayer, a focus, a focus of intention. That's the first word. The second word there, constantly. They were constantly united in prayer. Do you know what that word means? That word means resolute, determined, persistent. And that's how they were in prayer. It is from this expression that we have the expression, that we understand prevailing prayer. In other words, prayer that stays with it until the answer comes. The disciples didn't just wait for God to do what he said he was going to do. They did their part. And I want to challenge you as we come to a close this morning. Whether it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whether it is the salvation of a loved one, whether it is an expectation God has put in your heart having to do with your family, your work, your own life, the future, whatever it is, I want to challenge you this morning to do as the disciples did, to make it to make a pact with yourself and with God. God, I'm not, I'm not just going to sit and wait. I am going to take hold of your promises. And I don't mean go to the Bible and say, hey, here's a great promise. That is not what I mean at all. Do you see what the disciples did? They had the word of Jesus. It was to them personally and directly. You wait. The gift of the Father is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. And they received that word. That's from Jesus for me.
That's what I'm talking about. What has Jesus put in your heart, through the Holy Spirit, in your heart and in your life, that you know it's from God, but you have not yet seen it come to pass? You're still waiting on it. Have you grown weary in prayer? Have you given up in prayer and said, well, I'll pray every once in a while, but I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I urge you this morning to dig in and to grab on constantly in prayer until the promise of the Father is yours in reality. Could we close in prayer this morning? Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the example of the disciples of what they did. And Lord, we know that this is an example for us as well. God, help us. Help us, God. Help us. Help me. Help me. Lord, to remember again, to look again at those things that you have spoken to my heart, things that you said you want to do in my life, promises that you have given me about the future. Lord, that I've grown tired of waiting for and that I've stopped praying for. Oh, God, oh, God, help us from this point onward, this moment onward, to be constantly in prayer, to be resolute, to be determined, to be persistent. Lord, that this thing you have spoken to me, this deep desire in my heart, this hope that is almost buried, Lord, I'm going to make that part of my prayer until I see it come to pass in my life. For God, you do not lie. Your word says you keep every promise you make. And so, Lord, if that's true, I want it to be true for me in my life. And God, I want to do my part. I'm going to do my part with the help of your Holy Spirit until your promise to me for my family, for my business, for my life, for my health, for my nature, for my future is true. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.